Well, welcome. I'm Steve Hamill, and today we're going to discuss sudden death in athletes, a significant problem for all of us because of the tragedy that occurs when one of these young, healthy people suddenly collapses in prime of life. I'm joined by Dr. Douglas Packer. Doug is a professor of medicine at Mayo and directs our health uh, rhythm program and was immediate past president of the Heart Rhythm Society and Mike Ackerman, professor of medicine at Mayo, who directs our high risk sudden death program and genetics program. So let me start this out uh, question to Doug. We have these athletes who die suddenly and they range all the way from high school students up to older men and women uh, doing m marathons. So what's the difference in causes? What causes, what kind of heart problems lead to sudden death in these individuals? Steve, I think you've already made one very important point, and that's that this is just not a problem that affects young kids. You know, you hear about it in high school sports, you hear about it in college sports. You don't frequently hear about it going on in a 70-year-old who is running that marathon. I do think that there's a difference between what the underlying disease is, but sometimes those differences are not so different. Obviously, when we all get older, if we've got high blood pressure or diabetes or something like that, then we may have a higher uh, likelihood of having coronary artery disease. And that certainly can be the case, or a cardiomyopathy in the absence of uh, plumbing problems. It's really a pump problem. So as we age, we may see more of those. But if you look at the younger patients, if you look at the kids that are in junior high or the kids in high school or college, it's very, very concerning because it may be different. They could have a cardiomyopathy. You know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is one of the more common uh, anomalies, but they can also have channelopathies. And Mike's the expert about that, but they may have some channel that doesn't transmit sodium or potassium ions in the right way, like long QT syndrome or Brugada's, or maybe even wolf parkinson white syndrome, which isn't a channelopathy per se or they might have some congenital uh, anomaly. So there's a spectrum. Um, you know, just because you're 70, it doesn't mean you can't have one of these earlier ones. It's just less common to have a channelopathy that for whatever reason doesn't show up until you're 60 or 65. It, it, but it, it's a huge problem. And even if you went in with all of these patients and did autopsies on every single one of them, at the end of the day in 40 to 50% of them, you simply may not know. So it is a huge problem in deciding what, especially if you take the mindset that what we're trying to do here is to avoid every single one of these sudden death episodes. And while that seems to make good public health policy, at the end of the day, it doesn't. And I think Mike is yeah. the expert at that. Well, let, let, yeah, let me ask uh, Mike that. So we, we have this situation, and, and I, I'm reminded of a nice study that Barry Marin did looking at high school athletes in Minnesota. Followed them for three years, looked at 650,000, and there were three sudden deaths. So the risk was one in 75,000. One was a coronary anomaly, one was myocarditis, uh, and one was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So how do you find this needle in a haystack? Well, Steve, it is a needle in a haystack. I mean, we, we talk about the magnitude of the problem but really we're talking about 50 to 100 athletes in the United States each year will die suddenly. Not, and not even all of those, 50 to 100, will be on the athletic field. And we heard from a variety of reasons why they might uh, die suddenly, and there's a variety of strategies out there. And I mean, the debate rages uh, across the pond between do we do it the American way, and the American way right now is making sure we take an excellent history, do we know the family history, do we know the athlete's personal history, and doing a careful exam. And our hope with that is that that would flag many of the at-risk athletes. Uh, in Italy and Japan and other parts of the world, they have already concluded that that approach is not enough. That in addition to taking a history and physical, we need to do at least a 12 lead electrocardiogram to try to screen for findable offenses for early warning signs electrocardiographically for a heart muscle disease like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for a heart electrical disease like long QT syndrome. But that has a lot of issues. 
uh, to the ECG. And we'll probably be talking about what are the warts and wrinkles to yeah, an let's, ECG let's, program. Let's go into that because if it's, if it's one in 75,000 kids we're trying to identify, how many routine ECGs are going to be abnormal on high school students? A lot. How many will be <laughs> sort of overcall, yeah. branded, and what's the significance of that? Yeah. Well, you know, if we think about it, really about 0.5%, one in 200 athletes probably have a genetic heart disease that deserves early detection, one of the sudden death predisposing heart conditions. And yet when you look at most ECG screening programs, their flaggable rate, <coughs> excuse me, is about 5 to 10% are being flagged. And so nobody's really talking about the collateral damage for unwinding or picking up that flag for 20 athletes who are gonna have a flagged ECG when only one out of those 20 athletes who have a finding on their ECG really has an important finding that may allow us to intervene, make an important diagnosis, implement therapies, and potentially prevent their sudden death. And so one of the things we recently did is there was a summit held in Seattle where a bunch of us gathered together, Jonathan Dresner led it, and we said let's stop the debate about should we or should we not do a screening ECG. Let's move the discussion to if we begin to do a screening ECG, what should that ECG screen look like? What should be the, the screenable offenses? Where should we set the QT threshold? Where should we set the voltage criteria for hypertrophy threshold? Or should we even have a hypertrophy threshold because shouldn't we have other sensitive markers? So it was a really refreshing discussion to sort of begin to say, what ECG findings do we need to flag to prompt attention to try to lower that hit rate from 5 to 10 percent to something more manageable so we don't have so many false positives? So that's, <clears throat> that's 5 to 10 percent where you might find yeah. an abnormality. And if you put, put that 5 to 10 percent within the context of probably 12 million new high school kids joining some athletic program, right. so it's not 5 to 10 percent of all kids that are going to have the abnormality. It's you know, 5 to 10 percent where you actually pick it up. Right. Uh, and so I, I, I think it's highly problematic because if you, you go back through the literature on this, then uh, the, the initial focus was on the QT interval, but even more so on a T wave. So we're going we're gonna to go through and we're going to find abnormal T waves in, in these kids and disqualify them for uh, athletic opportunities. I think, you know, the 5 to 10 percent, you set criteria. And you get those, but out of those that actually qualify for a preset criteria, that, that's, let's almost call that genotypical. I mean, it's a phenotype, but yeah. out of that group, what percentage of those would even have a problem? For example, you take somebody who's got a Brigada's pat uh, pattern. So you've got this great looking ECG, but they've never had CKP, they've never had uh, any sudden death event, there's nothing in the family. What's the probability? that somebody with a 5 to 10 percent chance for an abnormality on an ECG are actually at risk. Right. Well, there you look at Brugada syndrome is probably one in 10,000 people, and that's going to be whether you're an athlete or not, Brugada syndrome is probably one in 10,000. Long QT syndrome is one in 2,000. I think the other issue there is when that flag is thrown in an ECG screening program and a finding is rendered, and then a person, an athlete, gets labeled with a possible something or another, the amount of energy it takes to pick up the flag and go into the review booth and say, I guess there's nothing there, is an extraordinary amount of time, effort, and expense. And then it depends on who is that athlete then going to, to get the call reversed. You know, we published that experience of 40% of patients who came to Mayo Clinic with a diagnosis of long QT syndrome rendered by heart rhythm specialists, adult and pediatric, left Mayo Clinic without a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. So the easiest thing that we have going is, okay, let's just do the ECG screen. We'll set up a set of benchmarks. The hardest thing is all the aftermath. And we need to be as bothered by all of the over diagnoses as bothered by that, that one tragedy. Mike, there's, there's also part of the screening should include history and physical. Right. 
I mean, that, that's where we started with all of this. The early Bethesda conference, that's mainly what they recommended was a good history and physical. So what are some of the worrisome things that may be found either on a physical or a history? I mean, we've talked a little bit about syncope and other symptoms that might occur that make that ECG more problematic. Well, I think the history is key. We've done an autopsy series of unexplained sudden deaths where the autopsy was negative. And in about half of those autopsy sudden death stories, there was a legitimate warning sign, not a Monday morning quarterback warning sign, but a wow. Things like, have you fainted suddenly and unexpectedly during exercise before? And saying, you know, a, a faint during exercise cannot be blown off. That's a penalty box faint. The second warning sign is know your family history. Any family history where there is a sudden unexpected death prior to the age of 50 needs to be checked into. That's not just historical sadness for that family and that pedigree. That might be an informative risk marker for that person, whether that person's an athlete or not an athlete. So we would like to suggest simplifying the questionnaires to two real things. Have you ever fainted suddenly and unexpectedly during exercise? Is there any deaths in your family that have been sudden and unexpected before the age of 50? If you said yes to either of those, you now go into the penalty box and you need to, to be checked out. Mm -hmm. and I think I was just, just going to say, say I think the, the other thing we need to remember is that the sudden death in the older population is more likely coronary artery disease. So it's, it's just modifying and working on the standard risk factors for coronary artery disease that helps to reduce the risk of sudden death in that population. <coughs> and I think that we've got a pretty good program for identifying sudden death in, in older patients. You know, looking at things like ejection fractions or looking at things like you know, family histories and the underlying risk factors and whether they smoke and have hypertension or diabetes or, or those sorts of things. So I, th I think in that group, the approach is a little bit better established. Now, I have to say that the pathways of life are littered with different kinds of ECG tests that you know, might have informed uh, the likelihood of sudden de death. But for the most part, I think we've got it down in older patients. Now, to some degree, there's a little bit of a problem there too because if there's a patient who is 70 years old and, and dies while running, society looks at that very differently than a high school yeah. senior who has the promise of being you know, a standout uh, all-star in college who uh, happens to drop suddenly. And, it, and it's, it's enormously tragic. You know, again, if we could prevent every single one of those, you know, we ought to, you know, we ought to do that. But for all the reasons that Michael said, it simply isn't that easy, and it really is that needle in the haystack. And then the, the little secret that we're not talking about that deserves to be mentioned is, as tragic as sudden death in athletes is, what's so special about an athlete? I mean, as a society, we should be as concerned about finding a sudden death predisposing heart condition like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, like long QT syndrome, in an artist just as well as an athlete, in the marching band player who goes halftime on the football field as in the athlete. So there seems to be something intrinsically wrong about saying we're only interested in finding these conditions in athletes. We're not as interested in finding them in a chess player who's going to have an incredibly intense match. And so I think we need to broaden and say if these diseases deserve to be detected early in life, then we should be thinking about how do we detect them for all people, whether you're an athlete or, or whether you're not an athlete. What it, what it means is that, <clears throat> that uh, patients should be seen, you know, when they're in junior high or in high school, by their physicians to do the simple screening sorts of things. You know, the history and the physical and uh, the history of syncope and the history of sudden death. And, and that should apply equally regardless of what sport they're playing. Yeah. And I think if you find the index case, so if you find a patient who has syncope, then it's, it's important then to pursue the other family members. Yeah. Not just stop at that one individual because that person may be the one that is introducing the family problem that you can get to and then help prevent sudden problems or sudden death in the rest of the family. So we have to uh, sum up now. This has been a tremendous discussion. So, so Mike, it, it sounds to me like
We are moving beyond saying, well, let's don't do ECGs, which was the U.S. way in the past. Now we will start supporting doing ECG screening, but, but what we'll look at are what are factors that we need to worry about. And then it still is the art of medicine, sort of working in, okay, we've seen an abnormal ECG. Is it really something that's putting that person at risk for sudden death, or is it just a marker that we should follow um, long term and see how that patient or that individual progresses? And, and I think a, a final point, Steve, might be that we make these decisions best on the best medical principles that we've got not based on some concept or concern about litigation. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we really need to be looking at all of these kids uh, in limited ways and that the decisions should be made based on, uh, you know, good medicine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, uh, Mike and Doug. This has been a great discussion. Really enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us. Uh, look forward to further discussions on this important topic.